Thank you for joining us today here on the traditional territory of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachin Council. I'd like to begin by acknowledging how fortunate we are that we are currently have no cases of COVID-19 here in the Yukon. This has been possible thanks to the collective efforts of Yukoners over the past several months. And I want to say thank you to everyone who has taken steps to keep our community safe. Although we currently have no cases, it is important that we do not become complacent. We're not out of the woods yet. Continuing our new normal depends on everyone taking personal responsibility and continuing to practice the safe six. And it also depends on our isolation requirements, border controls, and enforcement rules. This afternoon, I want to spend a few minutes discussing what our government is doing to continue to protect the health, safety, and livelihoods of Yukoners. First, we are extending the state of emergency in the Yukon. Without the state of emergency, all the ministerial orders we have made under the Civil Emergency Measures Act would expire tomorrow. That would mean, for instance, that we would no longer be able to enforce self-isolation if an individual has traveled outside of BC or the other territories. We, would, we also would no longer be able to enforce border declarations nor any other measures that have been implemented pr to protect Yukoners from the spread of COVID-19. It would also mean that orders we have put in place to support businesses and individuals impacted by COVID, such as the Residential Landlord and Tenant Order, which provides eviction protection for essential tenants as a result of COVID, would stop. Another order we have put in place authorizes the extension of timelines under the Societies Act, the Business Corporations Act, and the Partnerships and Business Names Act. This ministerial order provides flexibility for societies and businesses to hold online AGMs and to meet filing and compliance, compliance requirements when legislated timelines may be difficult to meet. This too would end tomorrow without the state of emergency. I want to be clear that extending the state of emergency does not indicate any change in the risk of COVID to Yukoners and it may be cancelled at any time. However, as long as the pandemic continues to pose a risk to the health, safety, and livelihoods of Yukoners, we may continue to extend it until other options become available. We will continue to evaluate the need for this tool as we progress along with the ministerial orders we have put in place. Our objective is to remain responsive to this dynamic situation that we find ourselves in and continue to be able to support Yukoners impacted by the pandemic. We will also repeal any orders that are no longer necessary to the current pandemic situation. The orders we have issued are not intended to be permanent. They are introduced as temporary measures to support Yukoners and mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. To that end, Today, we are repealing five ministerial orders and allowing one to expire in 90 days. <clears throat> First, the property tax relief order temporarily extended property tax and local improvement charge deadlines from July 2nd to September 2nd, 2020. Many Yukoners paid their property taxes before the July 2nd deadline, but many other Yukoners and Yukon businesses paid by the September 2nd deadline. As that date has now passed, we can safely repeal this ministerial order. The remote cannabis sales order allowed cannabis licensees to conduct online and telephone sales with in-person pickup to support physical distancing in an uncertain retail environment. While we are repealing this order, we recognize that it was a welcome opportunity for licensees and customers and we look forward to discussing the possibility of adjusting policies to allow for online sales in the future, but not to use pandemic tools. The self-isolation exception for traditional activities order exempted individuals from specified First Nations who entered the Yukon with the express purpose of engaging in Aboriginal and treaty rights from the requirements to self-isolate. Since we created a mobility bubble with British Columbia, the Northwest Territories, and Nunavut, this 
this order is no longer required. The virtual commissioning, signing, and witnessing order enabled important legal documents like wills and powers of attorney to be witnessed remotely. As we are now in phase three of our reopening plan, we believe it can be repealed at this time. The driver medical order temporarily exempted drivers uh, who are 70 years of age or have uh, a commercial licenses from having to submit a medical examination certificate if required. Since in-person care with physicians has resumed, we are letting that order expire in 90 days. This will provide a transition period to ensure there is sufficient time to get a medical exam. Individuals who are required to submit a medical examination certificate will be notified by the Department of Highways and Public Works. And finally, the Amendment of Government Contract Provisions Order temporarily provided Deputy Ministers the ability to amend government contracts where the proponent was adversely affected by COVID. This authority was put in place to accommodate a nimble response to the pandemic should it have been necessary. With the situation today being more stable, existing contract management procedures are able to manage any pandemic-related changes that may come forward, and as such, we are repealing this order. As long as the state of emergency is active, we can adapt and react quickly to the impacts of the pandemic, here at home or outside the Yukon, in order to safely maintain our new normal. While we wait for an effective treatment or vaccine, public health measures need to remain in place to limit the risk of infection in the Yukon. The World Health Organization continues to consider COVID-19 a pandemic, and there is an increase in the rate of infection in other jurisdictions in Canada, including British Columbia and Alberta, and in the US, including Alaska. When we first declared the state of emergency here in the Yukon on March 27th, there were just under 60 cases in Alaska. When we extended the emergency on June 12th, there were a little over 600 cases in Alaska. Today, as we again extend the emergency here in the Yukon, Alaska now has had just under 6,000 cases. Keeping our territory safe and healthy remains our top priority and requires us all to work together. Again, we are fortunate that we have had a total of 15 cases none requiring hospitalization, and currently have no cases of COVID-19 here in the Yukon. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Stryker. Dr. Hanley? Thank you, and thank you, Minister Stryker. Uh, good afternoon, bon après-midi. While it's good to note that some of the ministerial orders have now been rescinded, it's important that for the moment we keep the overall SEMA state of emergency in place at least for the next while as we move from summer, such as it was, into the Yukon fall. We really don't know what lies ahead of us and we need the ability to respond quickly in the event that some unexpected event does happen. We only have to look to Ontario and BC to see changes they have recently had to make. In Ontario, they're delaying their move to uh, phase three for a month as case counts continue to rise. And as you will have heard, nightclubs and banquet halls were closed yesterday in BC, along with rule changes on how late alcohol can be served and how turned up the music can be. They're having to take a few steps back because people were continuing to gather and to be exposed to COVID in these venues. This is the essence of what Dr. Henry calls BC's second ripple, likely one of many ripples ahead. So back in Yukon, continuing SEMA does give us the tools and the flexibility to respond quickly to a changing picture in Yukon if we need to. We opened the BC bubble on July 1st. More than two months later, we have had only one case. People continue to come and go. Yukoners are leaving the territory for a variety of reasons, either to BC, the North, or further afield, for holidays and get-togethers, taking students to university, or visiting with loved ones who are ill. 
They come home, self-isolate if required, and still we have no new cases. This success is for the most part due to you, Connors, following the safe six. So thank you for doing this and please keep it up as we head out of the summer. I still receive or hear about questions about either moving back and mandating self-isolation for travel to BC, but also on the flip side about why are we not opening up to other jurisdictions? My answer for now, in short, is still that it is best to stay where we are while we observe the increasing COVID activity in many parts of Canada. And also while we continue to get children settled into schools and while people correspondingly move back into workplaces. Schools and our work to support the well-being of children and teachers back into schools has been our priority of late. The Department of Education is working with schools as they implement the health and safety guidelines at school level. Schools are continuing three weeks in to settle into new routines with staff and students continuing to adapt. With the sports and recreation and contact sport guidelines now out, we're working with the Department of Education and the Yukon School Athletics Association and school principals to determine what that means for school sports and how kids can get back into the game. I have said that phase three will be a long phase with restrictions lifted slowly. One of these is the playing of wind instruments and recent media coverage questions why the city and school bands can't practice fully with all members on all their instruments. As a musician myself, a wind player, in fact, I understand the frustration of not being able to play in a group or as part of a larger band, and I also understand the disappointment of cancelled concerts and events. But I do want to assure you that we have been working on guidelines for lower risk playing of wind instruments and hope to have these out soon. So hopefully players are practicing at home and have been keeping their chops in shape. We're only a few people, the same team working on guidance for return to schools, return to sports, return to worship, use of non-medical masks are the ones working on how to put a pandemic orchestra together. We don't make our decisions lightly. We review the evidence, look at the plans of other jurisdictions and weigh the risk before we make a decision. The opening of school and the beginning of sports is presenting a whole new set of challenges for everyone. We now have bubbles and cohorts and everything in between. And I hear regularly from people who are trying to figure out what it all means. I just wanted to go over a few of those points. The social bubble is the family and friends bubble. No more than 15 people in total and no more than 10 at a time. A group is a larger group or sports group and remains limited to that activity. A child should stay with uh, his or her classmates while at school. An individual playing sports will be put into a mini league, three to four teams playing together, organized as per the sports guidelines. They should stay within their mini league, t within their mini league teams while playing the sport. And no drinks after the game unless in a well-spaced way that adheres to public health guidance. So we will continue to work on clarifying our guidance on bubbles and gatherings. In rural communities where populations are small, families may be related and interact with each other at school and in community activities, and it can be harder to define where a bubble begins and ends. And that may be okay, but if there's one theme to emphasize and repeat, it is keep your social circle small, be deliberate, and aware of who your closer interactions are with. We don't have to look far to see the consequences of ignoring this advice. The weather this week is reminding us that fall is well on its way and we will be spending more time indoors than out. With people closer together, it is of utmost importance that we continue to follow the safe six. We wash our hands, cough away from others into an elbow or sleeve, stay two meters apart from those not in our bubbles, and most important of all, stay home and away from others when sick. And that's all for today, thanks. Thank you. We'll now go to, uh, to the phone lines and we'll begin with Haley, Yukon News. Hi, thank you. 
Um, I was wondering if there's a response to the Tourism Industry Association of the Yukon's letter um, requesting that the bubble be opened for winter tourism operations. I, I actually probably couldn't give you an up-to-date uh, response because I've, I've been um, away for a few days. I know our team has been working on on a response. Um, and uh, I, I will, um, I, I do have um, conversations um, and have uh, enjoyed a conversation a few weeks ago with the, with the tourism in, industry. Um, it is, um, it, it's definitely a challenge to reconcile um, what the, um, what, what the, the, the incredible um, impact that the pandemic has had on, on Yukon tourism. I think that we have to, um, and, and without, you know, giving a yes or no to the, to the question, I just think we have to be um, very, uh, very careful about maintaining um, the best image possible for Yukon for future. And this is, um, this is just a bad year for tourism. And I think it's going to continue into winter to be a bad year for tourism. Uh, a lot of winter tourism depends on international, um, international uh, tourism, of course, and that's beyond our control as, as a territory. Um, and I really think we have to start thinking of what can we do to um, to make this an ideal place for tourism as um, as we move beyond into the late stages of the pandemic and beyond and and, and make um, make sure that we welcome um, people from all over the world uh, well when we're able to. So I think in general, we have to take just a, a longer term approach. We um, have uh, enjoyed uh, a, little, a little bit of tourism um, over, um, over the, the summer um, with the opening to BC, but recognizing that this is really more of an opportunity for Yukoners to get out um, rather than um, any uh, realistic impact on um, on the tourism industry in Yukon. It's, it's taken a huge hit, and I think we have to lay the groundwork for a recovery in the longer term. I will just add a little bit. I uh, was speaking with Minister Gendys earlier today. I know that she was uh, on a, a call with her federal, provincial, uh, territorial counterparts talking about tourism uh, across the country nationally. So I know that she's uh, working closely with uh, Taya and uh, our tourism operators here. Um, I think that you know, we'll do our best to take the recommendations that Dr. Hanley and his office give us regarding uh, 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 travel. Um, and I think we'll continue to work with the tourism industry to find ways to support it over the long term. Uh, and, and both through uh, our, our business relief programs, but also through programs that are specific for tourism. Uh, I, yeah, so no, no response to the letter that I know of yet today, but of course I would need to turn uh, to Minister Dendys for that specific information. Thank you. Follow-up question, Haley? Yeah, I guess my follow-up is um, part of the letter was really asking for a solid kind of yes or no as to to whether things will open up. Um, is there any is there any plan? Is there any cutoff date where we say no, we're not opening things until the spring? Is there a plan to to put that out there at any time? Do you want me to start? Okay. Um, you know, Haley, uh, I appreciate the uh, importance of of uh, of the ability to plan for our tourism operators uh, and and when uh, Minister Dendys has spoken with our tourism operators and when I've been on their calls to talk about COVID and enforcement, it, the challenge is that uh, we are not able to predict where things are going. I mean, who would have uh, thought what the the turn, for example, that happened in in our neighbors. 
to to the south uh, with Alaska and, and the U.S. Those things were not uh, necessarily predictable. So we have to remain somewhat responsive. I think that uh, the, what what can be offered is the ability to stay in close contact and uh, and work with tourism operators. I just uh, don't know how much uh, predictability we can give. Uh, I think that uh, I, you know we'll have to wait for Minister Dendies to respond directly to Taya. Uh, I'm sure she is working closely with them. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have much to add. I, I, I think it's just I, I, I can again sense the or hear the frustration, and I, and I again did hear directly from um, representatives of the tourism industry asking for that uh, more of that predictability and, and certainty, because of course tourism takes planning, um, and and so. Um, I, I, I just have to agree with the minister that it's it, it is it is a difficult uh, thing to be to to establish certainty when when we're really uh, looking at phenomena that change uh, that change from week to week. Um, so I hear the concerns and we'll do what we can. I think to um, uh, to to at least uh, to at least let people know what what. Uh, you know what what we're thinking, but um, establishing establishing that firm a deadline at this point um, is not is not possible. It's not realistic. Thank you. We'll move to Gabrielle Whitehorse Star. Hi, I have a question regarding the the length of the state of emergency. I'm curious. Um, for things like enforcement rules, is there a way to legislate those aspects in a different way so that the state of emergency could end? Or is the state of emergency necessary for the length of COVID being a risk, which could be, say, for another year? Um, well, uh, any changes to legislation, of course, have to go through the legislature. Uh, we, we have a Civil Emergencies Measures Act, which is pretty out of date and I I'm I think uh, as we've worked through it with the various uh, departments we can see that uh, it, it didn't really anticipate uh, a pandemic like COVID so there's definitely things that need to be improved in the legislation I mean today what we need to do is focus on how to uh, support and keep Yukoners safe that's our most important and pressing issue uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, have conversations about uh, how we can improve the legislation over time. That would be great. Uh, our legislation basically leaves it so that if we wish to have uh, uh, requirements for isolation, if we wish to have border controls, that those uh, require us to use uh, uh, ministerial orders under the state of emergency. So. Uh, I think the important thing for us to do is to acknowledge that uh, our, our primary concern needs to be to uh, navigate this uh, pandemic as best as we can, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll look to try and improve uh, the legislation in the future on a go-forward basis so that the next time uh, we're, we're dealing with something like COVID, we're, we're, we have better tools at our disposal. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Gabrielle? Yeah, my second question is looking for an update on the two students who didn't self-isolate before moving into Yukon University. Um, is it safe to say at this point that those students haven't experienced any symptoms? I know that um, people who are on campus on those two days have been told to self-monitor, and I'm wondering how long that should continue for. Yeah, I don't have the um, the timelines with me. I, I haven't heard of any um, any issues associated with that uh, with that incident since, um, and I believe that's um, at least uh, 
at least a week, if not 10 days, 20, 10 days at this point. Um, so they, they would have received um, instructions, usually to self-monitor uh, self for a period of two weeks from the time of exposure. So, um, so the, that, that will be coming close, but I, I couldn't tell you the exact day, but, uh, but I think you could probably do the math based on the date, uh, the, the date of, of exposure. Um, but, but again, you know, keep in mind that uh, the, the the response that the Yukon College um, made they they did uh, they did a lot in a short time. They went to extraordinary lengths to uh, to assure um, continued safety um, for um, for opening of of the university, um, and uh, I I think that. Um, uh, they, um, you know, the risk from any one person, uh, again, coming from another another province is going to be very low. So I, th I think all of this was really pre very much precautionary action, um, swift and prompt and, and very thorough. Uh, and I haven't heard of any, uh, any issues arising since then. Thank you. We'll go now to Claudiane, Radio-Canada. Euh, euh, docteur Henley, si c'est possible de m'expliquer en français vos, euh, votre, euh, votre argumentaire par rapport à la fermeture de la frontière avec la Colombie-Britannique ou encore l'ouverture de la frontière avec d'autres juridictions, pourquoi ne pas euh, bouger là-dessus? Là? So, Dr. Henley, can you please explain in French uh, your rationale for either opening the border or closing the border with Alberta and British Columbia, for example? Oui, merci. Et uh, ce que j'ai expliqué en anglais, c'était que je, je reçois um, de, toujours, j'entends des questions uh, um, de ou à, à, à un côté de pourquoi pas fermer euh, les portes euh, avec euh, Colombie-Britannique ou euh, par contre euh, pourquoi pas ouvrir au, au reste du Canada ou, ou au moins d'autres juridictions, d'autres provinces. Et euh, donc pour moi, la priorité maintenant, euh, on observe euh, une augmentation de, de cas dans plusieurs, plusieurs parties du Canada. Et aussi, la, la priorité, c'est pour, um, pour, um, um, pour bien gérer l'ouverture um, des écoles. Et donc, d'avoir de, de, le temps pour les, les familles, les, les enfants, les, les professeurs, um, d'adapter aux routines scolaires. Et euh, aussi, euh, pendant qu'il y a plusieurs personnes qui retournent au, euh, au, au, euh, aux endroits de travail. Donc, euh, pour ça, c'est... Euh c'est pour pas toucher dans autres euh, dans autres parties de, de réponse. On est dans un bon état euh, avec euh, un cas seulement du puits le voiture avec euh, Plumbie Britannique. Maintenant, on, on a passé, passé deux mois. Um, donc, on est, on est dans un bon état, mais en même temps, on, on observe cette augmentation de cas. Donc, en balance, le, je pense que la, la bonne direction, c'est de, de rester sur place pour le moment. Avez-vous une autre question, Claudiane? Bien sûr. Pour uh, le uh, ministre Stryker, juste en regardant le... Unemployment rates obviously having gone up in uh, July. Ontario and Quebec today were uh, meeting to see how they can collaborate to uh, kickstart the economy. Is Yukon looking at doing anything similar? Are we looking ahead at how to uh, get the economy back on track? If you can get me that, give me that in French. I'll pass this is fast. We. Uh... <laughs> I'll start in, in English, Claudiane, and if I can do a few words in French, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, our Department of Economic Development and uh, Minister Pillay have been working very closely with the Business Advisory uh, Council to uh, talk about uh, uh, the recovery plan. I know they've done a lot of work on it, uh, and uh, yes, I understand that uh, our 
levels of unemployment have gone up here in the Yukon, absolutely. Um, but, you know, when I look at those uh, unemployment levels uh, compared to the rest of Canada, we're still uh, in in a, in a better position uh, generally. So it's it's a uh, 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 an issue, absolutely. But also, uh, it's uh, it's it's an issue everywhere, and and comparatively, we're doing well. Um, I I know that uh, Minister Pillay uh, is working closely on this, and and I don't have uh, news uh, for you today. Uh, I I expect that uh, uh, that he would be the right person to uh, pose this question to directly. Um, but I, I I do know that they're looking at uh, various facets around economic recovery. For example, working with my own department would be things like investment in infrastructure and. Uh, Land development because those are important parts uh, of the economy that that community services works on, and I can say that uh, from that perspective, housing starts, uh, 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 infrastructure across all of our communities, we're actually in a bit of a boom right now. So the challenge of COVID, of course, and and as the earlier questions alluded to with tourism, is that it's very it's it's got a real different impact depending which sector we're talking about. So we'll have to have a, a sector targeted approach uh, to try and uh, uh, have as part of the recovery program. Okay, en français, uh, qu'est-ce que je veux dire? Uh, Jusque le, le niveau de, qu'est-ce que c'est le mot pour unemployment? OK. Uh, le niveau pour sans emploi ici au Yukon, c'est plus haut aujourd'hui que les autres mois, mais c'est moins, moins haut que, que les autres provinces uh, au Canada. Alors, c'est un problème, oui, mais uh, je pense que le, le travail avec le, le Business Advisory Council, le Conseil de... Uh, de the business advisory, je m'excuse, uh, c'est un, une bonne opportunité ici uh, pour, uh, pour un plan pour uh, recouvrir, je m'excuse, Claudiane, but that's uh, a, just, just to say that I, I think the recovery plan is coming. We'll move now to the reporters uh, in-house with us and we'll begin with Tim from CKRW. Hi, my question's for Dr. Hanley. Good afternoon. Um, just wanted to, has there been any discussion about, uh, again, early in the game, and I'm as cautious as anybody, as anybody else about uh, the implementation of the a vaccine? We're hearing more stories come out each day about vaccine development. I get it's not going to be early till er, early next year, potentially, but have those discussions started with Health Canada or at the federal level about imp potential, and I stress potential, implementation in the territory? Yeah, so d discussions, there are, I, I guess, many levels of discussions, um, and and uh, there is, uh, def definitely it is part of our discussions already um, with my counterparts around the country and with the public health agency on early, early planning. Um, and, uh, of course, one of the uh, leading organizations is uh, NACI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, which is already uh, looking into... Um, the vaccine vaccine products um, as they are um, coming through the through the pipeline, but also um, on implementation planning. Um, we um, locally, um, our current focus is on the influenza vaccine, and and that will be um, available later later this fall in um, late late October. And so we are, and we will be giving more details about uh, about the, uh, the the flu campaign, and really using that as a uh, the, the the flu vaccine campaign, using that as a kind of a template for how we would um, how we would uh, do the the COVID vaccine at the same time there are there are going to be differences in influenza vaccine we have uh, we're anticipating and hoping for more people to get the flu shot this year than last year and uh, and and planning accordingly in in terms of our um, orders and supplies um, so we are um, um, 
putting in place, uh, of course, w to, do a, to do a flu campaign well in a COVID time means that we have to observe all of those public, uh, public safety measures in terms of how we do spacing, how we do, how we do appointments. Uh, and, and so um, the immunization program and community nursing have been uh, working very hard on putting plans for that, um, that influenza campaign um, in place. And, and much of it will be will be paralleled when we get to that um, fortunate time of having a COVID vaccine uh, available. Next question, Tim. Obviously, before we get to a vaccine, it's still practicing uh, the safe six. I know my hands are uh, uh, a lot more moisturized than they were in March and April. I haven't been washing them as much, unfortunately. Are you seeing... You, Connors, may be letting up a little bit. Is this a concern to you? You know, it's always it, it is always a concern because it's hard to keep up. Um, it, it is hard for any of us to consistently keep up a practice. So we we all need reminding uh, yourself, myself included. We need to remind ourselves. We need to remind each other. We need to get better at at reminding each other, um, and being humble enough to uh, to. Um, to, to relearn when we forget. Um, so I think it's natural. It's, it's, it's natural for any population to, to stray, to, uh, to forget. And it's, and it's more challenging when we don't see, when we don't see COVID activity. Um, and, and, we, and of course, we've seen so little in, in the last few weeks. So I think, um, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't sense that there's a deliberate, um, 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 disagreement um, or discomfort with our measures. I do. I I do see a kind of a a, a general um, a general relaxing um, from time to time. I don't know that I see uh, um, or hear anything consistent. I do think, though, um, that uh, we we need to take every opportunity to. Uh, to, to 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 stay attuned to the risk because it really is all about managing the risk, and I think one of the best ways to think about it is uh, just uh, um, act act like we have COVID amongst us, you know, so that because it is that unanticipated introduction of a case that that uh, can lead to uh, to an outbreak and, and to transmission in our community so always act as if um, the person that you uh, that you don't know may have been exposed may potentially be transmitting and and and, and keep that in mind thank you, thank you. we'll move now to uh, Philippe from CBC North Thank you. A question for Dr. Hanley. I believe it was a year ago or a bit more, the government had changed the Pharmacists Act. And one of the changes in the act was allowing uh, pharmacists to give vaccines. Uh, there weren't any last year, but do you know if this year, if you Connors will be able to get their flu vaccine at uh, Shoppers Drug Mart or some other place uh, similar? Yeah, good question. So yeah, we are anticipating um, we, we are anticipating that uh, pharmacists will be able to um, help with the flu campaign uh, this year, um, but I don't have details at, at this point in terms of how, how that you know which ones who will participate and who will not who will not. But we, um, with the big we, have been working very hard on on, on making sure that um, all of the these steps have been in place operationally to allow pharmacists to administer influenza vaccines. So more to come on that. The second question I would have would be for Minister Stryker. Does the emergency declaration change anything of how the Legislative Assembly operates? Uh, no. Uh, I think that uh, we uh, don't have anything in that emergency declaration that, that speci speaks specifically to the Legislative Assembly. But I know that uh, they've been, uh, the Legislative Assembly Office has been the, and the uh, Speaker have been working on a plan about how to uh, conduct uh, the business of the Legislature in a way that will be safe and how we can uh, make sure to still 
uh, connect with you, Connors, because of course, uh, as you know, the seating in there for both the media and for guests of the legislature are, it can be uh, close quarters. And so we're gonna have to navigate that in a way to make sure that it's safe uh, for all members and, and for the Yukon. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. Our next COVID-19 update is scheduled for Wednesday, September 16th at 2 p.m.